spirit is the ethical life of a nation insofar as it is the immediate truth, the individual that is a world. It must advance to the consciousness of what it is immediately, must leave behind it the beauty of ethical life, and by passing through a series of shapes, attain to a knowledge of itself. These shapes, however, are distinguished from the previous ones by the fact that they are real spirits, actualities in the strict meaning of the word, and instead of being shapes merely of consciousness, are shapes of a world. Paragraph 441 is among the shorter paragraphs in this entire section and in the phenomenology, but like many of these very short paragraphs, there's a lot packed in there that we need to, to dwell on and discuss. Here, Hegel is going to be talking about a process that is occurring, or rather, that already has occurred and which we as the phenomenological riders along are observing having taken place in the development of human culture, human consciousness. And he's stressing a point that um, is very important to, to emphasize at the beginning of this section. I've already done that a little bit in, in some of the previous discussions of this, this uh, introductory uh, set of paragraphs. But what that, that point is, is that we've now moved to a higher level. Some sort of transcendence has taken place in moving from the previous grand scale shapes of consciousness, which are really a whole bunch of shapes, gestalten of consciousness, a sequence of them. We've moved up in an order and now we're at the level of the real, of the wirklich, of the actual, in a way that we haven't been before. So let's take a look at what, what Hegel is saying here. He begins with this very pregnant sentence um, about spirit, saying spirit is the ethical life of a nation, a folk, and we should, we should dwell on that just for a moment, this, this uh, word folk. We've, we've talked about this before earlier on in the reason section when we were discussing um, you know, the, the ethical substance and how that was found in a folk. So we could translate folk as nation or people or even nationality, if you like. And Hegel is writing at a time when there, there, there really is a question of the the German folk. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, you know, one of his predecessors, Fichte, has written an address to the German nation. Germany is divided into a set of states, some of them quite weak, some of them quite powerful. Uh, Berlin, you know, where Hegel is going to eventually teach, is in, in Prussia, which is probably the strongest of the states, but Bavaria is also important. Uh, Austria itself is, you know, this sort of mixed, uh, um, uh, this mixed community, we might say, in terms of ethnicity, is, is getting involved, of course, in, in German politics, right? And other states have already come together as, as folks. The English, the, the Swedes <laughs> were very powerful uh, until the, the, uh, the 19th century. Um, you know, the French, the Spanish, the, you know, the Russians, they're, they're all coming on the scene. And so we could think of it in terms of nations as, as what we're understanding, you know, in, in 19th century and 20th century Europe and then the, the larger world with nationalism. But, you know, if we, if we also think about where Hegel is beginning, we are talking about communities that could be as small as a Greek city-state. In using examples that are coming from Greek literature, ancient classical Greek literature like Sophocles' Antigone, where we're thinking about the city of Thebes, which is a northern city in, in Greece, we're talking about a very small community. And there, there were a lot of not quite necessarily city-states, but smaller uh, communities 
And it was a question of, well, how do we, how do we understand them? Where can an ethical life be situated? A zitlikis leben. Um, can we talk about a community actually having its own ethical life? Um, perhaps at a certain size, it becomes too large for that. Perhaps in our own time, the internet helps to mediate that. So that size isn't such of a uh, issue. Perhaps uh, we have to think about local communities. All of this is stuff that we can think about as we're, we're going through this. So spirit is to be found in the ethical life of the nation. And he says, insofar, there's an important qualifier, right? Insofar as it is the immediate truth. Now that by itself is a bit of an oxymoron within the Hegelian way of putting things because we begin with certainty and then we move to truth through mediation, right? Uh, so to talk about immediate truth already means that there's a bit of deceptiveness there. Whatever is immediate is not entirely what it, what it is supposed to be upon analysis. But what is its immediate truth? Here's where it gets really interesting. The individual, now notice what the key thing I've underlined here, the individual as a world, the individual that is a world, not the world, but a world, Einwelt, right? So what do we mean here? Well, are we talking about what, what Hegel would later call world historical individuals? It could be them, or it could also be people who find themselves drawn in and assuming, you know, one side of a particular shape of consciousness. Um, but the individual, as we've seen in the previous paragraphs, is no longer totally detached from the world, alienated from the, the world, the social world that they belong to within the matrix of the folk, the, the community. They, in a certain way, represent it. And this is a, uh, what we can say, this is a naive perspective. This is a a beginning place. This is not the finished position that Hegel has worked out. This is where we start from. And so Hegel is going to trace out a process of development that begins with what he's calling here the beauty of ethical life. And now that may sound a little strange as a phrase, so let's think about what, what he's talking about there. When you belong to a community for some brief shining moment and you think that everything actually does in fact make sense, even if it's because you're blind to the social contradictions <laughs> running throughout your entire culture or you're unaware of the history or all these other things. People do have this mindset. Everything is great here. Oh my gosh, this is wonderful. That's what he's calling the beauty of ethical life. It's not just that everything's great, I, I enjoy pleasure, people treat me nice. You're able to do something. Ethics is a matter of agency, of action. And you're able to act in such a way as to produce beautiful or fine or noble actions. So, you know, let's say you belong to uh, a nonprofit and you are helping to save the world by doing this wonderful task here. And you don't really look into the books or the operations of the nonprofit because, you know, once you start doing that sort of thing, contradictions start arising. You start seeing that your mission and the effects are not quite adequate to each other <clears throat> or that uh, a number of the contributions that come in actually go to paying staffers and that there's a hierarchical organization and the people at the top make a lot of the money right and less of the people at the bottom who are supposed to be benefited from it are getting those benefits well those you know sorts of things are there but you can be blind to them you can just not have thought about them and so long as you're in that state what you're doing can seem to be, you to be quite beautiful. And it can seem to other people. So you go out to the bar and people ask, what do you do for a living? Oh, I help these people by doing, oh, you're such a wonderful person. I had something similar to that. This is a bit of a digression, but it's a nice example. I, I used to teach in a maximum security prison. That was my first full-time teaching job. And um, I went in with you know, very few illusions about it. 
Um, I think some of the other people who went in thought that they were, you know, these wonderful do-gooders who were, you know, teaching to the oppressed. And, and some of that's true, right? I mean, prisons uh, are, are in general not well managed and there's a lot of vindictiveness going on in the treatment of prisoners. And it varies from state to state, from DOC to DOC. So I don't want to generalize too much. But here's where it got very interesting. So I would have, I, I would be at academic conferences and, um, you know, we have these name tags and people would look down and they'd see Ball State at ISP. And they'd say, oh, what, what's ISP? And I'd say Indiana State Prison. And they'd say, oh, you teach in a maximum security prison? And there, there were really three main reactions. One, one reaction was, you know, well, I'm not going to talk with this guy because that's not a real teaching job because those aren't real people. So conversations over, right? That happens sometimes. And then there were the people who were much more, you know, interested and realistic about it, and we'd have a good conversation. And then there were the people who would come out with these lines like, oh my goodness, that is so wonderful that you're doing this, this beautiful service for these poor oppressed people, most of whom are innocent. Uh, and, you know, it would go on and on and on and on. And I, I would... Um, at first, you know, I thought we were having a genuine conversation and try to say, well, it's not really quite like that. And uh, some of them are innocent, but most of them aren't, um, as they'll tell you if you actually teach them. And uh, they weren't interested in having that conversation. They were interested in there being some sort of beautiful image that could be regarded. Makes perfect sense from a Hegelian perspective. People like that. That's what we would call, you know, uh, an immediate truth. Hegel thinks that consciousness must continue to develop. So we have these shapes, these gestalten of consciousness. This is a familiar theme, isn't it, to everybody who's been reading the phenomenology. And this is ultimately supposed to culminate in spirit's knowledge. And the word here that Hegel uses is not erkentness, it, or anerkennen recognition, it's wissen, it's knowledge of itself. We're leading up towards, you know, absolute knowledge, which is where the, the book culminates. So this is supposed to be the end of the spirit section. And what is happening in the spirit section is the development of these shapes of consciousness and working through them. They, each one, you know, starts out as usual, very uh, promising and then eventually collapses, but we learn something in the process and there is a transcendence that is occurring here. Now, here's where it gets particularly interesting. And, and this is what I was talking about as the real core of this, this paragraph. Hegel says that... By passing through this series of shapes, it attains to a knowledge of itself. These shapes, however, are distinguished from the previous ones. What are the previous ones? Those in the consciousness, self-consciousness, and reason section. By what? By the fact that these shapes are real spirits. They are real minds, geist, right? Each one is an actuality. He says that actuality is in the strict meaning of the word. What is he contrasting this to? Instead of being shapes merely of consciousness. So as we saw in the previous uh, few paragraphs, the earlier portions of the work were tracing out dialectical progression that wasn't actually situated in a particular life in a real community. I mean, it was to some degree, but it could be extricated from that and abstracted. Now we're talking about something that is, you might say, closer to home, closer to actuality. And Hegel takes what is happening in the spirit section to be tracing out the development of human consciousness as real, actual consciousness. That is what he means by spirit. The living ethical world is spirit in its truth. When spirit first arrives at an abstract knowledge of its essence, ethical life is submerged into, in the formal universality of legality or law.
Spirit, which henceforth is divided within itself, traces one of its worlds, the realm of culture, in the harsh reality of its objective element. Over against this realm, it traces in the element of thought the world of belief or faith, the realm of essential being. Both worlds, however, when grasped by spirit, which, after this loss of itself, withdraws into itself, when grasped by the notion, are confounded and revolutionized by the insight of the individual and the diffusion of that insight, known as the Enlightenment. And the realm which was divided and expanded into this world and the beyond returns into self-consciousness, which now, in the form of morality, grasps itself as the essentiality and essence as the actual self. It no longer places its world and its ground outside of itself, but lets everything fade into itself, and as conscience, is spirit that is certain of itself. Paragraph 442 should be regarded as something like an itinerary a roadmap for where we are going to be going in this gigantic portion of the work spirit. You notice that it's going to culminate in the enlightenment and morality. The enlightenment is something that we can definitely identify with a particular period of time. Uh, we'll talk about that in just a moment. And Hegel is telling us about how we actually get there. And he takes this as being the genuine historic process of not just the development of consciousness, but the development of ethical consciousness, the development of the ethical life within communities for human beings. Doesn't mean that every single human being at every single point was, you know, exactly on board with the ethical development because we're talking about massive uh, historical movements. Uh, but this, this is something that we can sort of, you know, retrospectively look back on and, and see played out uh, at multiple places and times in history. So he starts out by saying the living ethical world is spirit in its truth, echoing the previous paragraph. The living ethical world, the, the world in which, you know, um, the, the ethical substance is not merely passive or static, but is actually doing something. There, there's activity, there's agency there. So he says, when spirit first arrives at an abstract knowledge of its essence, remember that is the goal for spirit to arrive at a knowledge of its very essence. Now he talks first here about an abstract knowledge of its essence. And then he talks about ethical life being submerged in the formal universality of legality, right? The formal, formal universality of, as Miller translated, legality or law, rect. Rect is this broad uh, uh, concept that encompasses both law as what is in place as law and the broader normativity of legality. The, the, you know, if you think about what it means to have a law or to have a rule or to have procedures, it means that we treat similar cases, ideally, as similar to each other. We generalize, we even universalize. So for example, when you need a driver's license in whatever state you happen to live in here in the United States, and it's issued by the state and you have to jump through certain hoops in order to get it, like showing certain documents and taking a road test, at least for the first time, and passing a written test. And then when you move from one state to another, oftentimes you have to take another written test, as I, I found out when I got various driver's licenses. That's a great example of what Hegel is calling the formal universality of legality. Um, are you treated as the person that you are, you know, in and, and for yourself? No, no, that's not the way the law works, right? Formally, formal universality treats everything at a certain level in an abstract way. And there's a lot more to it. And we're going to explore that as we, we go into, you know, the next main section of the work. Um, 
But ultimately, there's going to be some, some issues with that. That is not going to be able to capture or to adequately express the ethical life of the community. So what do we move to next? Hegel is going to discuss uh, two things that he calls both realms, Reich, you know, domains, you could also say. He also calls these worlds. Um, so let's look at the, 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 pa the paragraph now. He says, spirit, which henceforth is divided within itself. Divided within itself, by the way, because of what happens in treating the law, traces one of its worlds, the realm of culture. Culture is building. This is that word that uh, doesn't just mean culture necessarily in a very narrow point of view, but the, the, the whole broad thing it encompasses education. It encompasses the ways in which we eat. It encompasses uh, the language that we use. Development is another way of, of thinking about building as well. The development of the, the person, but the development on a larger scale, not as a purely isolated individual or not just because the laws say so, but because there's some motivating, motivating ideal or, or set of ideals. So the realm of culture, right? Uh, spirit traces one of its worlds, the realm of culture, in the harsh reality of its objective element, he says. Over against this realm, now we have another. Over against this realm, it traces in the element of thought the world of belief or faith. And again, Miller is, is splitting up in his translation uh, one term, Glauben, into two different English synonyms for it, just as he did with, with uh, Recht. So Glauben, faith, belief, both of those work. He is actually talking about religious belief in this case, because what we're tracing here is the development of human consciousness in European history, according to Hegel. And you might say, well, wait a second, what about the rest of the world? Well, that's a valid point, valid uh, uh, worry, but Hegel is not going to be particularly concerned with that here. So we're going to follow along with, with Hegel. So he calls this, the realm of faith, the realm of essential being. Now notice what he says then. Both worlds, when grasped by spirit, which after this loss of itself withdraws into itself, when grasped by the notion, are confounded and revolutionized. Hegel uses that term, revolutionieren, there, uh, which is you know, essentially a loan word uh, coming from French, uh, talking about what the individuals are doing. When the individual, uh, the, the insight of the individual, uh, confounds, verwirrt, and revolutionizes these worlds, the world of faith, the world of culture. Um, at first, this is through individuals, say, writing a book or taking a stand. You might think, for example, of the, something that Hegel you know, thought quite a lot about, the workings of the Reformation, the Protestant Reformation in Europe. Did it come about because of important social developments that were happening, you know, uh, within, within society? Yes, that certainly primed it. But it did take people like Martin Luther doing something and then sticking with doing that something. Um, and then, you know, further developments down, down the line. Descartes, right? Plenty of people were doubting things at the time. As a matter of fact, you can, you can read in French literature uh, some of these, these previous doubters, right? Uh, you know, Montaigne, for example, Charon, you know, uh, interesting writers. However, Descartes does something different. Actually, Descartes doesn't really want to doubt. He wants to start a new scientific project. But that, that doubting is part of how he revolutionizes things. Um, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, you know, uh, Voltaire, people like that, uh, David Hume, in a certain respect, are, are changing things as individuals, as are so many political leaders, as are so many other people, 
And when that starts to assume a critical mass and diffuse itself throughout the culture and within the realm of faith, you know, we often picture that those leading the charge against, you know, uh, superstition and dogmatism were never within the church. They were these courageous outsiders. That's not the case at all. If you know your European history, many of those figures were, you know, people with, within the church. Um, and, and so what, what happens, Hegel says, is this, this uh, um, we have this process of the insight of the individual and the diffusion of that insight. That diffusion is known as the enlightenment. Um, enlightenment is the English term that we use. The Germans use a similar cognate term, Aufklarung. The French speak of the siècle de lumière, right? And what are, we, what are we talking about, you know, when we signify, say, the 18th century as an age of enlightenment? We are saying that this sort of insight of the individual is indeed, like Hegel says, becoming diffused or spreading out, as I just said, attaining a kind of critical mass within society. People are able to communicate with each other. There is the development of, you know, a communicative sphere in coffee shops, in journals, it, you know, rivaling the, the uh, er, earlier realms. Now, what happens after that? Hegel goes on and he says, the realm which was divided and expanded into this world and the beyond, right? The realm of faith was this world and beyond. Grasp uh, is now returning into self-consciousness, which now in the form of morality, moralitet, um, something that is coming out of the, the enlightenment. And we're going to see all these projects of practical reason to try to make sense out of things. Grasps itself as the essentiality and essence as the actual self, it, it no longer places its world and its ground outside of itself, but lets everything fade into itself. It becomes the judge of everything else. It, it, it sucks everything into its own purview. And then he finishes by talking about conscience, uh, Gewissheit. It is spirit that is certain of itself. That is what we're driving towards in, in this entire spirit section, this, this process of development. The ethical world, the world which is rent asunder into this world and a beyond and the moral view of the world, are thus the spirits whose process and return into the simple self-consciousness of spirit are now to be developed. The goal and outcome of that process will appear on the scene as the actual self-consciousness of absolute spirit. Paragraph 443 draws this introductory section to this massive spirit portion of the work to a close by talking about spirits as a plurality and talking about how we're going to get back to spirit as a unity or, if you like, as a totality. So Hegel says the ethical world is rent asunder into... Uh, this world and a beyond, and the moral view of the world. So the ethical world that we're starting out with winds up culminating towards the end in this realm of, of faith, right, of, of Glauben, where we have a this side and the other side, something that we've seen already played out in the unhappy consciousness section, um, and which is going to arise you know, over and over again and get fuller treatment. Then we have the moral, moralisha, view of the world, which is happening through the enlightenment and the diffusion of that into the world of the realm, the world of faith and the world of culture. In this process, Hegel says, we have spirits whose process and return into the simple self-consciousness of spirit are now to be developed. So what we have is spirit separating itself out into various shapes of consciousness, some of which are going to jockey with each other or wind up in conflict or antithesis with each other. Ultimately, we're aiming for some sort of unified perspective that brings everything back together.
Um, that's not something we can assume at the start. As a matter of fact, you know, we're showing at the start that what looks like that, what looks like the ethical life of the nation is actually breaking up into this plurality of, of spirits. So he says the goal and outcome of that process will appear on the scene as the actual self-consciousness of absolute spirit. Now that is the promise for what we should attain in the next 230 odd paragraphs. It's not something that we can begin with. It is, as I said, something like a distant lighthouse whose beacon shows us where we're supposed to be heading. But first we need to make our way through the various shoals and reefs and, and rocks so we can get ourselves there and try to avoid shipwreck, or if we do have shipwreck, build a ship back up along the way. 